Welcome to Health and Wellness. I'm your host, Kearney Warren, and today we're speaking about cancer genetics and risk assessment. Our guest for the day is Jill Stauffer, who is a certified genetics counselor. Jill, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us here on Health and Wellness. First, can you please describe to our audience what genetic counseling is and what your primary focus is as a genetic counselor? Sure, yes, I'm happy to do that. So uh, genetic counselors are typically masters prepared professionals and we work in a variety of settings uh, in healthcare where there is concern that there may be a genetic component to a diagnosis or a genetic or inherited component to a risk for some form of condition in a family. So examples of what genetic counselors do, uh, some of us work in prenatal uh, in the prenatal arena where there's a concern that uh, there could be a child born with a particular condition that has a, a hereditary component so a genetic counselor may be involved in discussing testing options to make a diagnosis um, or screening options to look for risk for certain inherited conditions so uh, those who are pregnant sometimes consult with a genetic counselor to learn about those options. Uh, genetic counselors work in the pediatric setting where there are children who have either known or suspected genetic conditions and in that setting often the genetic counselor will help a family better understand what that condition is, what resources are available for that condition and also help a family understand is this something that they're likely to see again in the family. Um, what's the risk of having another child with the same thing, those sorts of issues. Uh, genetic counselors now also work in the cancer arena, which is my specialty area, where there's either known or suspected uh, risk for cancer that runs in families. So there's some sort of hereditary component to why there's too much cancer in the family. And in general, uh, genetic counselors have at their disposal a variety of testing options. We can do uh, different types of genetic testing depending on what the question is to try to add more information to the picture about what is this, how is this inherited. And if you can find genetic risk, and usually these tests are done with either a blood test or saliva sample, pretty easy to do, uh, at least having the test done is pretty easy to do, then it can help a whole family understand what's going on and then sometimes other people will want to be tested for that same thing if there is uh, something you can pinpoint with a genetic test. Okay. Now, you, you, you mentioned that your primary focus is with cancer um, genetics, and I understand that you are a founding member of the Cancer Genetics Program at the Abramson Center here at University of Pennsylvania. Can you speak about um, your role with the center and what actually, um, what are some of the services that are offered there? Yes, so it's been a very, very um, interesting and gratifying place to be. Uh, since 1994, when we started this program, uh, we were working with families with too much breast cancer and trying to figure out why is that. And at that point in time, when we first got here, it was prior to the discovery of these genes, uh, BRC1 and 2, that we now know so much about. Uh, and so we were working to uh, advance the research to try to figure out what's the explanation for uh, cancer risk in the families and then over time we grew into a really um, big clinical service so a program that provides a place for people to go to learn more about whether they carry genetic risk for cancer uh, so we offer risk assessment that is getting the details of your family history down who has cancer what age did they develop their cancer, um, and we're good at spotting patterns that might suggest, haha, you know, this pattern really looks to be perhaps due to this particular gene, and if that's the case, then we can offer uh, genetic testing for that. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary approach here at Penn, and so our program is staffed by both physicians and genetic counselors. Depending on the practice setting, um, if we're in the breast ovarian program, then our physicians are both breast oncologists who also specialize in genetics. So if someone does have genetic risk, then there's a place that they can be followed by experts who understand what are the cancer risks here and what are the best ways to be followed, what are the options to reduce risk, what are the interventions that might be helpful, uh, and there's a, um, 
you know, a plan of action that can be put in place, and then if someone wants, they can be followed here over time, uh, eternally, <laughs> uh, to you know, help them hopefully stay healthy. Uh, we also have here people who come to us who've already had a cancer diagnosis, mm -hmm. and what they're looking for is an explanation. Why is this genetic? Are my children at risk? What about my sisters? What about my nieces? And so the same process can unfold for those people to try to help them understand what's going on. Are they at risk for other cancers? Should other things be suggested to try to you know, stave off uh, additional problems? And um, on occasion, there are even now directed treatment options for those who have a cancer diagnosis that is contingent on their particular genetic risk. So as an example, there are some specific medicines that oncologists can suggest to their patients based on the understanding that this person has inherited genetic risk and this specific treatment or medicine may be particularly effective given what we understand about the biology of their cancer through genetic testing. Okay, now you, you've mentioned a lot and I, I want to go back to some of the key points that you, um, you spoke about. One, uh, you talked about the BRCA1 and 2 gene. Uh, there's some misconception about who has the cancer gene, what the cancer gene is, um, what happens if there's a mutation of the cancer gene. Can you explain um, what those two genes are and um, who's at risk for those gene, for, of having uh, the gene mutation? Also, um, are there different cancer genes that are specific to different types of cancer? Sure. So um, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are abbreviations for BR for breast, CA for cancer. BRCA1 was the first one of its type to be discovered back in 1994. BRCA2 was the second gene of its type to be discovered uh, the following year. And everybody has two copies of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. That is a normal situation. We all have these genes. One is inherited from your mother. One is inherited from your father. Someone who is at average risk for breast and ovarian cancer based on their BRCA1 and 2 status has two working, functional, good copies of those genes. So it is something we all have. A person can have increased risk for breast and ovarian cancer due to BRCA1 or 2 because one of those genes from either mother or father was inherited in an altered form, in a form that doesn't work. Um, and when we think about genes, we think about them as being spelled with a genetic code, a gene has to be spelled the right way to be understood, just like a word has to be spelled a certain way to be understandable. So a gene has to be spelled in a particular way for the body to understand what instruction it's receiving from that gene. Genetic testing is kind of like spell checking. You're looking for misspellings. So some people are born with a misspelling in a gene that they inherited from their mother or their father and that person then is born with a higher than average risk to develop certain forms of cancer. So we know that with BRCA1 and 2, those lifetime chances are quite striking. So the lifetime chance for breast cancer is in the range of about 60 to 80 percent. And that compares to the average woman's risk for breast cancer, which is about 12 to 13 percent. We know women with BRCA1 or 2 mutations are also at higher risk for ovarian cancer, anywhere up to about a 40% chance for ovarian cancer, and that compares to about a 1 to 2% chance for the average woman. So these are very significant uh, uh, risks attached to these genes, and there's a whole list of things that people can do to address their risks, to lower their risks, to take up special screening at earlier ages that they ordinarily wouldn't be doing. I think the take home message is that there are things to do about it. Identifying genetic risk is not just about labeling someone or unearthing scary information where there's nothing to do about it other than worry. There's a lot that can be done for people who are identified 
with genetic risk for cancer. And so it's important that those people be uh, identified uh, and, and how do we do that? So the best way we know of um, for the BRCA1 and 2 genes right now is to ask questions about the person's personal history of cancer, if they've had uh, cancer themselves, or their family history, who in the family's had cancer. Um, we know that all women, for example, with ovarian cancer, if that's all you know about that woman, all women with ovarian cancer are candidates for genetic testing for BRCA1 and 2 based on national guidelines. And that's because there's about a 10% pickup rate just based on that diagnosis. So that's an easy one. It's a very you know, broad category. If you're a woman who has epithelial ovarian cancer, a certain type of ovarian cancer, you're a good candidate to consider this type of genetic testing. Um, we know that if there are multiple people in the family with the same form of cancer, going from one generation to the next, that suggests that something is hereditary. We're seeing an inherited pattern. Okay. So is there a specific process or admission um, process that someone would have to go through if they wanted to uh, take advantage of the genetic counseling or some of the services that are offered uh, here? Yes, so there are a number of ways to get involved. Um, one is to just call our, our new patient office here to be set up for genetic counseling. That number is 215-349-9093. Um, another way to get a lot of information about what we're doing here, both clinically, what are some standard recommendations for those with BRCA-related risk, and what are we doing on a research basis is to go to the Basser website, which is www.basser.org. Um, and it has our recommendations for uh, care uh, and, again, a great deal of background about these genes and, and what they do. Well, I want to thank you so very much for um, sharing your time with us and discussing the cancer uh, genetics and risk assessment. Thank you for watching Health and Wellness.